October 1855 Epistle 13th General Epistle of the Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to the saints in the valleys of the mountains and those scattered abroad throughout the earth. Greeting. Beloved brethren, under the blessings of an overruling providence, whose tender mercies are over all his works, we are again permitted to write unto you concerning matters and things pertaining to the kingdom of our God. We have abundant reason for gratitude and thanksgiving unto our Father in heaven, who hath shielded us from the power of the adversary, the stratagems and wicked devices of ungodly men. For a time the saints have been left to pursue the even tenor of their way, without molestation or hindrance from abroad, while peace and tranquillity have reigned supreme in all the valleys of the mountains. In May last we visited, in company with a few of our brethren, the southern settlements, counseling and instructing the people, among whom we are happy in believing that a general spirit of contentment and desire to do right extensively prevail. And although we found them with their crops almost entirely destroyed by the ravages of grasshoppers, rendering our hard exertions and the labors of their hands fruitless, still we heard not a murmur, nor repining, nor complaining, but rather a firm and determined reliance upon the Lord of, of hosts and their continued exertions for sustenance. Although the crops were so generally cut off as late as from the 1st to the 10th and the 15th of June, and though the small remainder afterwards suffered much from the drought, still the late crops of corn and vegetables and some late sown wheat have matured in sufficient quantity, it is believed, to supply the wants of the community until another harvest. There will, however, probably be a scarcity of wheat. All kinds of fruit trees have borne abundantly, although they also suffered from the ravages of grasshoppers and the effects of the drought. Brethren, the Lord has touched us lightly. Be advised by this gentle chastening. Give heed unto the whisperings of the Spirit, and tempt not the Lord to bring upon us a heavier rod of discipline, that we may more fully escape those judgments of high heaven's King, which are now abroad upon the earth, and being poured out upon the children of men. When plenty shall again crown your efforts, let heaven's bountiful blessings be sufficiently appreciated to cause you to exercise the proper economy for their care and preservation. The Indians in our settlements have been generally friendly, and though indications of hostilities will occasionally arise, still we have the satisfaction of believing that a good impression has been made upon them, and that the time is not far distant when we may more surely rely upon their peaceful disposition towards the whites. The more we witness the workings of the peaceful policy which we have practiced and endeavored to have our brethren practice towards them, the more we are convinced of its being the proper one, and best calculated to promote their interest and salvation as well as ours. Besides being the cheapest, it is far easier and exercises a better influence to feed and clothe than to fight them. Be merciful, therefore, and patient with the poor, degraded, and ignorant children of the mountains and the plains. They are the seed of Abraham, unto whom pertain the promises, seek to enlighten, and bring them back unto a knowledge of the Lord God of their fathers. Remember that he is their God today, as well as anciently, and that he witnesses with equal interest the movements of the children of Israel, as when he gave them instructions from Sinai's consecrated mount, the temple of Solomon, or Calvary's blood-stained soil. The time of restitution approaches. Be up and doing, therefore, while the day lasts, while there is an opportunity of rendering them assistance and doing them service, that you may hear the approving words, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. While great exertions have been made, and are making, towards converting the heathen in distant nations, and upon the islands of the sea, we have in our very midst a people just as worthy and intelligent, just as capable, and every way as much entitled to receive the gospel, then let the words of life and salvation be extended unto them. Let the messengers of peace go and instruct them in the arts of civilized life. Teach them to plant and sow, reap and mow, raise stock, build houses, make farms, and forsake their evil and pernicious practices, their wanderings and ill-paid predatory or hunting excursions. Influence them to obtain a living without depending upon hunting, for that furnishes them a very precarious and scanty subsistence. Give them your faith and prayers as well as works. Instill in their minds the spirit of peace and eternal truth, that the visions thereof may be opened to a knowledge of the Lord their God and of Jesus Christ whom he hath sent. At the same time, brethren, preserve yourselves from the treachery and savage fury, from their loathsome and degrading vices, 
and seek to elevate them in the scale of being to your own level, but never condescend to theirs, as is too often practiced by the whites. Show them that you are superiors by your more noble and virtuous acts and bearing, and that you are not with them for selfish or unholy purposes. It is a pleasing sight to see so many of the children of the Lamanites and the families and the saints, where they have the same opportunities and privileges as the white children, and we trust that great good will result unto the rising generation through this source. On the second day of September, the Utahs and Shoshones met in the city and made a treaty of peace, which it is hoped will be permanent and prove of lasting benefit to all parties concerned, including the whites. Near the Elk Mountains and on the left bank of the Grand River, the Indians killed three men and some twenty head of cattle and drove the settlers away. They came to Manti and will probably not return this fall, notwithstanding they left nearly everything belonging to them in the possession of the Indians. With this exception, there has been no actual outbreak during this season, although there have been a few hostile demonstrations and threatenings, which cause is at the present unknown. We trust that all matters will soon be satisfactorily explained and amicable relations restored. Then the settlers may be able to return to their location in the ensuing spring. The endowment house in this city was dedicated on the 5th of May last and received the name the House of the Lord. Since then, endowments have been regularly given and are still continued, principally under the direction of President Heber C. Kimball. The church historian house and office has been erected and is now being finished. A large amount of stone has been laid in the temple foundation which has been finished, ready for the basement story, but owing to want of stone, the work, since the 1st of August, has been and still is suspended. The teams engaged in hauling stone had to be turned away to range, in consequence of the feeds falling in the vicinity of the quarry and city. We hope to obviate the occurrence of similar suspension in future by availing ourselves of the big cottonwood canal which it is expected will be ready for operations by the 1st of May next, and upon which we design to bring the granite stone for the further erection of the temple. A foundry has been put in operation, and has furnished very superior articles, mostly for machinery and mechanical purposes. Its operations have been much facilitated by the use of stone coal, large and valuable beds of which of excellent quality were discovered in the early part of the season, in San Pete Valley, near Fort Ephraim, and a considerable quantity has been brought to the city, but it is located at too great a distance to become available at this point for general consumption. Through the facilities afforded at the public machine shop, cutlery of a good quality has been manufactured, also locks and many other articles for general use. Much more cloth than heretofore is being made in the various settlements, also leather, hats, cordage, brushes, soap, paper, combs, crockery, iron, and various other useful and self-sustaining articles are being organized from the native elements in flattering abundance. Many good buildings have been erected during the season, among which we mention the courthouse, warden house at the penitentiary, and finishing the south wing of the state house at Fillmore, besides other extensive and permanent improvements both in city and country. Many mills and various other kinds of machinery have been put into successful operation. The hum of industry has awakened the silence of these vast solitudes, and while hill and dale resound with the woodman's song, with the tinkling bell of the herdman's charge, and the rumbling caused by the husbandman's and artisan's toil, the clattering mills mingle their sounds with the roar of the mountain streams, while the Indian hies away to his secret spring by the mountain bush, or seeks shelter among the sage of the barren plain. Thus, where but a few short years ago were heard naught but the howling wolf, the savage war-whoop, or the raven's cry, we now hear many a nook and corner echoing with the sound of civilized exertion, and behold them surrounded with all those appliances of wealth adapted to the white man's home. In many lands and among strangers we have traveled many a weary mile, without purse, scrip, or murmur, to preach the gospel of salvation to the people, and can scarcely find hospitable shelter for the night. But here we can travel throughout the length and breadth of the land, and seldom meet with any but saints, those who have come out of the world, to serve the Lord, keep His commandments, and do His bidding. We recognize in the Union peace and prosperity which have attended our settlements in these far-off regions, the hand of a kind providence, whose blessings have been multiplied upon a people in whom He has delight, and who seek to do His will. 
The aid of the PE Fund Company has this year been extended to some 1,300 persons, nearly a fourth of the season's immigration. This operation, though the hard times in the English conference and the great scarcity of money at home, has had a tendency to involve us somewhat in debt. Many of the brethren here have sent for their friends through the aid of the PE Fund Company, and they have arrived and are on their way hither. Over 600 of this year's immigration are of this class. Now let the brethren who have been sent help us meet the liabilities which we have incurred on their account and pay up their obligations to the fund. Let those who feel an interest in the work of the gathering be liberal in their donations and prompt in paying what they owe, that the fund may be sustained and our next year's operations be not crippled for the want of means. The cry from our poor brethren in foreign countries for deliverance is great. The hand of the oppressor is heavy upon them and they have no other prospect on earth through which they can hope for assistance. Many of them are long in the church, and have been faithful in all things, acting in the discharge of every duty. Shall we turn a deaf ear to their appeals, and leave them to linger in the midst of wicked Babylon, where year after year the perplexity and distress of nations, their wickedness, abominations, and corruptions, wars, pestilence, and persecutions are multiplied by waxing greater and greater, thus constantly tending more completely to hedge up the way and render their long continuance in those lands more burdensome and oppressive than ever? Let this question be answered by your acts, for to this resource we are driven, and unless we receive aid, either by donations or the payments of debts owing to the company, we shall be obliged to measurably suspend operations the ensuing year. We have already extended relief to the utmost limit and have almost entirely absorbed every available resource of the church to aid in this matter. We trust, therefore, that you will make it a subject of careful consideration and prompt and proper action, for it is worthy of your most active benevolence. It has long engaged our attention and that of our elders on foreign missions, has been the theme of our prayers and communications in times past, and commends itself to the attention of all saints as opening the only at present known effectual door of temporal salvation to the really destitute. Thousands upon thousands of the immigrants who annually flock to the shores of America, though not of the wealthy classes, have means wherewith to come and, su and subsist until they find channels of profitable occupation. But the P.E. Fund is designed to, de to deliver the honest poor, the pauper if you please, from the thraldom of ages, from localities where poverty is a crime and beggary an offense against the law, where every avenue to rise to in the scale of being to any degree of respectable joyous existence is forever closed, and place them in a land where honest labor and industry meet a suitable reward, where the higher walks of life are open to the humblest and poorest, and where they can lay a foundation for insolubly uniting themselves and their children in the progressive scale of human existence while eternity comes and eternity goes. This is true charity, and should engage the efforts of every philanthropist, not only to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, but to place them in a situation where they can produce by their own labor their subsistence. The world at present furnishes no place so well adapted as this for the exercise of such benevolence, no spot so suitable for the homes of the poor, no country more in need of their labor to bring into use its undeveloped and we might say, unexplored resources. No government where institutions beckon the competition of the low as well as the high, of the poor as well as the rich, nor where honesty, capability, and merit, instead of high birth, place, and worth so often and so surely pave the way to honor and influence. The season's immigration has mostly arrived, and we learn that the remainder are near at hand. They have been very much favored by the experience of several returning elders, under whose charge they have principally traveled. We have to regret the loss of many of the faithful who have fallen victims to the power of the destroyer and pestilence, among whom we make mention of brothers W. W. Major and John Perry of the English, Andrew L. Lamoureux of the French, James F. Bell and Lady of the Italian, and Jacob F. C. Christ of the Swiss Missions. While we mourn their loss and deeply sympathize with the bereaved family and friends, we rejoice that when they fell they were in the service of their Redeemer and engaged in the promotion of His cause upon the earth. We trust, therefore, 
that they were taken for a wise purpose, and that they will meet the approval of the judge of the whole earth in the day of reckoning and recompense. Elders Lyman and Rich are still in California, laboring in San Bernardino and other places in that state. Elder Orson Hyde is in Carson County, Utah Territory, where he has organized a branch of the church. Elder Taylor is in New York, presiding and editing the Mormon. Elder F. D. Richards is in Liverpool, presiding over the European mission and editing and publishing the Star. Elder George A. Smith is still engaged as historian and general church recorder, and together with the remainder of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, the Presidents of Seventies and others, is laboring in the various settlements of Utah, directed from time to time as duty seemed to require. Elder Orson Spencer is editing and publishing the St. Louis Luminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and George Q. Cannon is engaged in the publication of the Book of Mormon in the Hawaiian language in San Francisco, California, where he also intends publishing a paper. Elder Dan Jones is publishing The Tramp of Zion in Swansea, South Wales. John Van Cott, the Scandinavian star in Copenhagen, and Augustus Farnham, the Zion's watchman in Australia. The East India missionaries have returned, or are on their way hither, having faithfully preached the gospel from two to five years in that benighted country, with but little apparent success. The work is still prospering in Australia, the Sandwich Islands, California, the British Isles, Denmark, Sweden, the north of Italy, Switzerland, France, the British provinces, and in many parts of the United States. At Cape Town, South Africa, there is also quite a branch of the church. A company of saints left Sydney for the purpose of gathering to San Bernardino in this place, but only a few as yet arrived on our western coast, the vessel having put into Honolulu in distress and been condemned, thus retarding their anticipated speedy arrival to our peaceful abodes. This is the first attempt at gathering the saints from Australia, and we hope it will prove successful, for there are many more in that region who strongly desire to gather with the saints in these valleys, but cannot as yet obtain means of conveyance, trade, and commerce from our western coast with that country being very limited. The saints are gathering home from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and while we are thus concentrating a heterogeneous mass of all kinds of people from almost all nations, through Though animated by one general spirit, intention, and desire, it becomes one and all to be kind, courteous, and gentle towards each other, and seek to instruct the people that they may be more strongly cemented in feeling, interest, peace, and union, as well as in faith, truth, and the bonds of the new and everlasting covenant. It was to this end, and to effect more fully this object, that the last conference appointed elders to take missions to all the settlements throughout Utah, that the people may become improved and cultivated in their taste and understanding, and in every grace and accomplishment, that they may be amalgamated in their views and feelings, be strengthened in their faith, and, by not omitting the small and generally esteemed trifling matters of practical life, that this generation of saints may be found pure and holy, mild and equitable in their intercourse with each other, even polished shafts after the similitude of a palace. Remember that it is the trifling things of life which make up our existence, and that but a small number of great and important events transpire without them. They are, however small, the important duties of life, upon the daily practice of which much depends to fit a people for the coming of the Lord Jesus, or to prepare them for an exaltation in the kingdom of our God. Therefore, give heed unto the teachings of those we have sent among you, and let all strife, animosity, contention cease in your midst. Live your religion, and let peace, faith, charity, and good works abound. To the elders appointed upon these missions we say, Go forth in the spirit of humility and meekness, and teach the people in the things pertaining to their temporal as well as their eternal salvation. Imbue the people with the spirit of holiness, cleanliness, and economy, and the Holy Ghost, which leadeth into all truth. To the elders abroad we say, Be diligent in all your labors, be faithful in your testimony to the people, and when they receive the truth, to learn them to live and practice their holy religion. It is easy to bear persecution, to contend for the faith, and even to die for it. The hardest of it all is to live it, and to be always actuated by its holy influences, and practice it in all the walks of life. It is not a plaything or mere toy to believe, amuse ourselves with at our convenience, and then lay aside, but a tangible, everyday experience, 
and solid fact entering into every avenue of business, of pastime and repose, as well as into the spiritually religious exercises of the mind. In fact, we have no requirement or duty upon this earth only to serve God, keep His commandments, gather the saints, and build up His kingdom thereon. For this we live, for this we expect to die, but the main difficulty with the saints is to live their holy religion and pursue that course which will ensure unto them its blessings and privileges, and that increase of faith, intelligence, and improvement which they may enjoy. It is a small matter to devote and dedicate ourselves and all we have to the cause of truth and the building up of the kingdom of God upon the earth. But it is of importance to rightly apply ourselves and our means where we might do the most good. It is important that we be obedient and passive in the hands of the servants of God, and when we have embraced the truth and placed ourselves with all we have upon the altar, to so remain, regardless alike of friend or foe, sunshine or shade, peace or plenty, of war, famine, and pestilence, it is our duty not only to profess and be believers, but to work out our salvation, continuing faithful in all things, even unto the end. When you enlist under the gospel banner, give the adversary a ticket of leave, and never again permit him an abiding place in your bosoms. Never again place yourselves under his influence. Neither anything which you possess, live to build up the kingdom of our God, and let your actions correspond with your professions. We say to the elders abroad as well as at home, let these principles be instilled into your minds and the minds of all the saints, and let them be amenable to the authorities which are placed over them. Live humble before the Lord, deal justly and righteously, that the Spirit of the Lord may richly abide in you. When the elders who are upon foreign missions wish to return home and have no instructions to that effect, it is their privilege to meet together, make the question a subject of prayer and supplication before the Lord, and then act as shall be decided in council in accordance with the dictates of the Holy Ghost. It is your privilege to know the mind and will of the Lord concerning these matters, and by pursuing the proper course you will obtain it. Let all things be done in order, and let all the saints who can gather up for Zion, and come while the way is open before them. Let the poor also come, whether they receive aid or not from the fund. Let them come on foot, with hand carts or wheelbarrows. Let them gird up their loins and walk through, and nothing shall hinder or stay them. In regard to the foreign immigration another year, let them pursue the northern route from Boston, New York, or Philadelphia, and land at Iowa City, or the then terminus of the railroad. There let them be provided with hand carts on which to draw their provisions and clothing. Then walk and draw them, thereby saving the immense expense every year your, for teams and outfit for crossing the plains. We are sanguine that such a train will tr out-travel any ox train that can be started. They should have a few good cows to furnish milk and a few beef cattle to drive and butcher as they may need. In this way, the expense, risk, loss, and perplexity of teams will be obviated, and the saints will more effectually escape the scenes of distress, anguish, and death which have often laid so many of our brethren and sisters in the dust. We purpose sending men of faith and experience, with suitable instructions, to some proper outfitting point to carry into effect the above suggestions. Let the saints, therefore, who intend to immigrate the ensuing year, understand that they are expected to walk and draw their luggage across the plains, and that they will be assisted by the fund in no other way. If any apostatize in consequence of this regulation, so much the better, for it is far better that such deny the faith before they start than to do so for a more trifling cause after they get here. And if they have not faith enough to undertake this job and accomplish it too, they have not faith sufficient to endure with the saints in Zion, the celestial law which leads to exaltation and eternal lives. If this project is once fairly tested and proves as successful as we have no doubt it will, the main expense of the immigration will be avoided. Consequently, thousands more than heretofore can receive assistance. Therefore, saints and all returning elders who undertake to come through with companies, consider this subject and prepare yourselves accordingly. During the general conference just closed, the youngerly people were counseled to obtain their endowments and marry. Hence we wish it understood that we are prepared to give the saints their endowments in the house of the Lord, 
which has been built and dedicated expressly for that purpose. Therefore, let parents, guardians, and bishops take this matter properly in hand, and counsel freely with the young people, and prepare them to receive their endowments and sealings. Young men, take unto yourselves wives of the daughters of Zion, and come up, and receive your endowments and sealings, that you may raise up a holy seed unto the God of Abraham, even a holy and royal priesthood, who shall be born legal heirs thereunto, having a right to the keys thereof, and to administer in all the ordinances pertaining to the house of the Lord. Cease your folly, and become men of God. Act wisely and righteously before him, and his joyous blessings will attend you. We exhort all the saints to live righteously, to remember and keep their covenants with their God and with each other, to pay their tithing and make their consecrations in the spirit of liberality and in all good conscience, nothing doubting. Keep the commandments of the Lord. Observe the instructions and counsel you receive from those placed over you to preside. Be faithful and industrious, economical and prudent. Seek continually unto the Lord for wisdom and train up your children in his nurture and admonition that when we shall have finished our pilgrimage upon the earth, we may go hence in peace, having wrought righteousness and established justice thereon, and through having fought the good fight and kept the faith, be prepared to come forth with a glorious resurrection to inherit eternal lives and exaltation, which may God grant for his dear son's sake. Amen. Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Jedediah M. Grant, G.S.L. City, October 29, 1855